Welcome to today's program titled Strategic Insights into the Future of ERISA 401k Fee Litigation, Trends, Case Analysis, and Emerging Claims. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those of you who are logged into the web presentation, you are encouraged to submit questions throughout the conference by typing them into the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. For those interested in obtaining CLE credit for this webinar, later in the presentation, we will read the CLE attendance verification code. Please write this code down as it will not be reread and it is required on the CLE credit request form. During the program, you will see a slide with a QR code that you may scan to access and submit your request for CLE credit. You can also find a link to the form in the connection details email you received this morning. Copies of the webinar recording and materials will be distributed to all attendees in the days following the webinar. On the next slide, you will see a legal disclaimer. This presentation has been prepared by Seifarth Shaw LLP for informational purposes only. The material discussed during the webinar should not be construed as legal advice or a legal opinion on any specific facts or circumstances. The content is intended for general information purposes only, and you are urged to consult a lawyer concerning your own situation and any specific legal questions you may have. At this time, I would like to turn it over to our first speaker for today's program, Tom Horan. Tom, please go ahead. Thanks, Kate, and thanks everyone for joining us today to spend a little bit of your Monday talking about ERISA litigation. Uh, I'm Tom Horan, and I'm joined today by my colleagues Ian Morrison, Ada Dolph, and Sam Schwartz Fenwick. Uh, we're collectively part of Seifarth's ERISA litigation group. Um, and if we go to the next slide, we'll take a look at our agenda for today. Uh, the agenda looks short, but I promise we're not short on content. Uh, we're going to spend some time talking about the overall 401k fee litigation and, and really fee litigation adjacent landscape. Uh, I'll lay that into some recent summary judgment and trial trends. Some of the recent developments we've seen with cases asserting prohibited transaction claims uh, and then for something slightly different at the end some of the new claims we see on the horizon in this space okay we can go to the next slide uh, and actually the one after this too so a bit of a refresher and kind of to, to start where we left off last time a uh, reminder that in 2023 uh, we saw kind of a decline in new cases filed in this space. So in the years kind of leading up to that, we'd seen almost 300 cases filed uh, with an all-time high of 101 in 2020 and 89 more in 2022, but that number fell to 48 in 2023. And one of the reasons that you know, was sort of speculated here and in other outlets as to why that number went down is simply that the plaintiff's firms who bring these cases were, were busy with the cases they'd already filed and maybe lacked the capacity to, to keep filing in the volume that they had. So as a test of that, 2023 also saw a record high of settlements. So if you figure people were filing lots of cases, people were busy, and then a lot of those cases settled. One of the things that we were expecting to see between the decline in filings and the rise in settlements was that 2024 filings would go back up. Uh, so to, to set that scene, we can go to the next slide and kind of take a look at where things have happened this year. Uh, so already this year, uh, this number is current as of the end of last week, there were 51 defined contribution class actions filed this year alone. Uh, in addition, there have been 10 cases that we were referring to as the pension risk transfer cases that talk about the annuity buyouts of pension plans. It's been 13, and that number I think is now higher, tobacco surcharge cases, and six other cases in the retirement plan class action space. So we are seeing an uptick. We're already over the total that we saw last year, still you know, two plus months to go this year. Uh, so fiduciary conduct remains a high volume focus uh, in, in the class action litigation space, uh, so much so that since the start of 2016, we've seen more than a third of defined contribution plans with over half a billion dollars in assets have been sued for some type of fiduciary breach claim. And if you reduce that universe to the plans with over a billion dollars, more than half have been sued in some form since the start of 2016. Uh, so you know, really the message is, and then the part, point of the part of today's presentation is if you're not thinking about the risks associated with these types of claims, you know, kind of yesterday is the time to start. Uh, Kate, we can go to the next slide. So one of the, the things that we've also been looking at that we think is leading to some of this increased filing uh, is 
the inconsistent results that we're seeing in the district courts. And some of the key areas that we're seeing those differences relate to the burdens of pleading and proof. And so you know, how do you actually plead and prove a claim? What the courts look for to find that a plaintiff has standing. Uh, and then this kind of interesting wrinkle about whether or not these claims can be tried to a jury. Uh, so on the burdens of pleading claim, you know, recall that there was the Devane and later the Hughes case that went up to the Supreme Court. And I think everybody was hoping we'd get some clarity around the pleading standard. And coming out of it, we haven't really seen that you know, be true. There's been some success uh, at the motion to dismiss stage and in certain circuit courts trying to argue that you know, the Supreme Court requires some type of meaningful benchmark or some type of meaningful comparison at the pleading stage to plead a claim. Uh, but we've also seen a number of courts and probably a growing trend of courts really looking at those ideas of the appropriateness of the comparators, the suitability of the benchmark as presenting something of a fact question that can't be resolved at the pleading stage. I think anecdotally, we're also seeing the filing sort of self-select into the courts where they're going to have an easier time at the pleading stage. You know, it feels like there are more cases being filed, for example, in the District of Massachusetts, uh, which has been particularly lenient on plaintiffs at the motion to dismiss stage. Uh, there's also this split of authority on the burden of causation, uh, meaning in situations where the plaintiffs either allege or can prove that a fiduciary breach occurred and that some loss to the plan occurred, there's a difference between the courts on which party bears the burden of showing that the breach actually caused the loss. Uh, and again, courts in the First Circuit and, and in other places uh, have been applying a burden shifting method that required the defendants to disprove causation and show objective prudence affirmatively, rather than requiring plaintiffs to make that showing. Uh, to keep the, the trend on sort of what we've seen happen with recent Supreme Court cases, in the full case, um, Supreme Court with respect to standing, required that a plaintiff be able to show that winning their claim will actually change their benefit to, to find that they have standing. That case came out of a defined benefit case, and we've seen mixed results with efforts to carry that over to the defined contribution case. Uh, this happens most often in investment-related claims where defendants have tried to argue that in order for plaintiffs to sue about the prudence uh, or performance of certain investment options, the plaintiffs actually have to have invested in the options that they're challenging. Uh, we've, again, we've seen mixed results there. Some courts have been willing to accept that argument and sort of extrapolate from the defined benefit context into the defined contribution space and say, if winning your case isn't going to change the benefit you're entitled to, you lack standing. Uh, other courts have said, you know, under a 502A2 claim, you're really suing on behalf of the plan. And if what you're alleging is the process for selecting and monitoring investments was imprudent, and you sort of make the conclusory assertion that that same process affected investment monitoring plan-wide, then really you can challenge more than the things you invested in. Uh, and that, I think, has continued to drive litigation in space. And then finally, we've seen this issue around jury trials. Certain plaintiffs' firms in particular continue to push for jury trials in this space. Uh, and while we've really seen you know, it's been a fairly small trend to this point, certainly the courts in the Second Circuit uh, have generally been reluctant or unwilling to strike a jury demand. And you know, we we saw a jury trial happen last year. Um, so you know the the prospect of pushing that issue, I think, has also caused some continued filings in this space. If we go to the next slide, uh, the settlement trends continue, right? So, so filings have been up in recent years and are up again this year. Uh, already this year, we've seen settlement approvals granted in 36 different ERISA class actions. Some of those relate to settlements that were reached last year or approvals that were actually filed last year, but ultimately the settlements approved this year have already resulted in the payout of more than $200 million in these cases, although I know here, uh, you know, one of those was, was over $60 million by itself, and so accounts for a big chunk of that. So the other thing we've seen is that a lot of these settlement values uh, are actually pretty small in the grand scheme of things, uh, which forces defendants in some cases to grapple with weighing the cost of defense against the cost of settlement, particularly at early stages of the litigation. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, not everything settled. Uh, we've seen in recent years, you know, certain cases, certain defendants uh, either have been unable to settle or unwilling to settle and have taken these cases uh, to decisions on the merits. And Ian's going to talk a little bit more about the the reasons why uh, we've seen some of these results. Uh, but we noted here that already this year, there have been 
five cases where defendants were granted summary judgment on excessive fee claims. Um, and those opinions, you know, have, have really reflected certain courts willingness to take a hard look at what the facts say about the fiduciary process uh, and, and kind of pay actual service to the notion that these are process based claims. Um, and then in contrast to sort of the light burdens we're seeing at the pleading stage where plaintiffs can kind of you know, extrapolate from 5500s or draw other sources of data and, and kind of say that they've made an inference of certain things. Courts have, in, at least in these certain instances, required more on the merits uh, and have required them to put some meat on you know, why that inference should be supported. And one of the things we've seen both in the summary judgment and trial context is courts rejecting as unreliable uh, attempts by plaintiffs experts, I think, to, to you know, go out on a limb and render opinions that sort of match the theories that we're seeing in the complaints to get by the pleading stage. Uh, and so to that point, since the middle of 2023, we've also seen uh, five defense verdicts at trial, including the jury trial I mentioned, uh, which really serves to, to drive home the point that summary judgment and trial remain viable defense strategies uh, in cases where settlement either isn't possible or is not something that the defendants are interested in. And to, to I think, give some more context on why these are some trends that we're seeing, I'll hand it off to Ian to talk a little bit more about some of the specific results we've seen. Sure. Thanks, Tom. And if we can go to the next slide, Kate, uh, and actually we can go to the next one. Um, Tom was spot on in saying that that fundamentally, um, I think what we're seeing. I mean, if you if you step back uh, and you go back to your you know civil procedure class in law school and remember what we all learned about motions to dismiss and summary judgment and trials and what they're for. Uh, I think we're seeing some of that play out, um, albeit a, a function in part of a very liberal interpretation of, of what Rule 12 and Rule 8 are allow, uh, require in these cases that is allowing um, many complaints to get past the pleading stage when there's actually nothing there. Um, but what it's, what, it, what it's led to is courts wanting to look at the facts. Um, and I think we all know that in breach of fiduciary duty cases, the facts are really determinative. Did, did the fiduciaries have a good process or not? Uh, did they do the things that, that good fiduciaries do or not? Um, and fundamentally, the case stands or falls based on that. So um, what we've seen play out is after discovery, defendants come back to the court and try to get the case dismissed or, or judgment entered in their favor um, by showing the facts to the judge. Unfortunately, the fact that most of these cases are going to be tried to the judge as the trier of fact and the decider of law um, means that some judges are, are less willing in an ERISA case to grant summary judgment than they might be in a case that would go to a jury trial. Um, the reasons for that are, are complicated. Uh, I mean, some judges, I think, are inclined to protect the public from having to sit uselessly in a jury trial. Um, if they can resolve the case as a matter of fact, and they, you know, matter of law rather, and they, they recognize that um, it's an imposition on, on members of the public to be on juries, and they want to save that for cases that really warrant it. And if you don't have a jury trial, you don't have that burden out there. Um, the other thing that, that I think goes unsaid by most courts, but it's got to be a factor, is that if the judge decides the case at summary judgment, the standard of review on appeal is de novo. So the appellate court will review everything freshly and decide whether the facts are in dispute and whether the law requires a judgment for one side or the other. Um, whereas if you go to trial and the judge bases a decision on fact findings, those fact findings are almost always reviewed for clear error, which is a very hard standard to meet if uh, you are uh, appealing from an adverse judgment, and, and a judge is probably thinking, well, if there's going to be an appeal from this decision by one side or the other, under what approach am I less likely to see the case again? If I, if I do it on summary judgment and throw the case out, there's a, a higher chance, not very high, but still higher chance that the case will come back and the judge will have to try it again uh, or try it. Um, Whereas if they decided on, uh, you know, findings of fact and conclusions of law after trial, there's a much lower chance that they're ever going to see this case again. 
Um, the other factor that, that is sometimes more expressly stated is that these are factual cases. And in a factual case, you should hear the evidence and, and decide what the facts show. Uh, we had a recent case where um, Judge Young in Boston um, denied in large part the summary judgment motions and then has a little coda at the end of his opinion in which he sort of launches into a diatribe against the overuse of summary judgment uh, by defense lawyers, particularly in ERISA cases, and contrast them to some securities and, and M&A cases where you know, people rush right to trial because they, in his view, have a sense for the jugular and um, know when a case should just be tried rather than trying to hash it out on the papers. And, and you, know, you see some of his frustration with that coming through uh, in the opinion. Um, now, he, he wrote that at the end of a, a very lengthy summary judgment opinion. We've seen the opposite happen, where the summary judgment opinion is literally a paragraph long, saying there are issues of fact, including but not limited to, blah. Uh, and, um, you know, that, that approach may be a product of any of these factors. You know, it's often, it's often difficult to tell. Um, but the fact is, despite that headwind, um, some defendants have prevailed on summary judgment. Uh, one notable win, uh, which I think picks up on an important defense theme that's really going to come to the fore even more in these cases, uh, came out of the 11th Circuit, which affirmed summary judgment. Um, and the court in that case uh, rejected what I refer to here as burden flipping, uh, this notion that Tom mentioned where if the plaintiff can show a breach, uh, procedural prudence by the fiduciary, then it becomes according to some courts, the fiduciary's obligation to prove that the outcome would have happened regardless of the breach. Uh, and essentially, the, the Fourth Circuit has said that the fiduciaries have to show that a prudent fiduciary would have done the same thing. Uh, the Eleventh Circuit rejects that soundly. It says you can't find any support for that in ERISA. Uh, and in fact, their prior cases had uh, held that the burden of proof always remains on the plaintiff. Um, I happen to think that's right, um, but I acknowledge that, that some circuits have disagreed with that view. And so depending on what circuit you're in, you may have to contend with this burden flipping idea. Um, but then the court goes on to say the defense can o or the defendants can only be liable if their breach caused the harm. So then you have to look at the breach and say, is there evidence in the record to support that that but for that breach, the plan wouldn't have suffered the harm, or is it a case where the harm is really the product of the vagaries of the market? You know, this investment the plan picked didn't perform well in the particular market at the particular time it was in the plan, um, and that would have happened whether or not you had a good process. Uh, the court ultimately found the plaintiffs had failed to meet their burden of proof and affirmed um, summary judgment. And it really focuses in not only on the importance of making the loss causation argument, um, but also on the fact that in many of these cases, the plaintiffs are taking advantage of periods of time where one investment underperforms others. Uh, and it's often possible to pick apart the plaintiff's damage and, and prudence expert reports by pointing to the fact that, well, they have isolated for some reason a particular period of time where there's alleged underperformance. If you look over a broader period or you move the start and end dates a little bit, you can eliminate the alleged damage. And I think that's very persuasive evidence to put in front of a court to show that, that this, this damage is only a process, a product of sort of myopia. And if you, if you zoom back out and look in a longer perspective, um, you'll see that there really is no harm there. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, um, we'll see a couple more district court decisions on summary judgment um, that kind of follow the similar, uh, similar theme. Um, these were not ones that turned exclusively on the notion of loss causation, uh, but the courts were willing to look through the record and decide the factual question of whether or not there was a prudent process and picked up on the fact that in both of these cases, the defense uh, mustered evidence that there was a there was a diligent process. The fiduciaries met regularly. They were engaged. Uh, they used experts uh, when it came to looking at fees. Uh, in both instances, there was extensive use of benchmarking. So the expert consultants to the plan would come in every year or two, present uh, evidence of how the plan's fees stacked up against other similar plans, 
um, and the, you know, that would drive whether or not the fiduciaries wanted to go out to bid on particular services. Um, in fact, in one case, there were, were in the Humana case, I believe, that the, they had done during the class period two RFPs in addition to regular benchmarking. And when you've got that kind of evidence showing that you've gone to market, um, either by looking at what the market is doing or by actually putting the plan out for bid, it's very hard for the plaintiff to overcome that and, sh and suggest that somehow the plan is overpaying. Um, the courts were skeptical of the plaintiff experts in both of these cases. Um, you, you see that, that you know, the expert witnesses are often put forward at summary judgment to try and set up a so-called battle of the experts and you know, create issues of fact to defeat summary judgment. Um, but uh, in both of these cases, the, the courts rejected those attempts and said, you know, there's not enough here to, to overcome the simple fact that there was a prudent process. And while the outcome might not be the one the plaintiffs like, it's the outcome of prudence there is no case here. Uh, so, you know, that's sort of a synopsis of what's going on at summary judgment. Uh, I think, you know, there are probably many cases out there where it's debatable whether summary judgment is a worthwhile thing to pursue. Um, but as, as I remarked earlier to Tom, I, I, I don't think Judge Young or, or me or anyone else is gonna persuade defense lawyers, including ourselves, not to seek summary judgment, because obviously if you get it, uh, it's game over for the plaintiff, uh, and you can avoid a very expensive trial. But, uh, you know, some judges may be very resistant to the idea, and, and um, you, know, you should know that going in and set expectations. We can go to the next slide. Um, the, sort of the key takeaways on summary judgment, um, one is what I was just talking about, is the judge really going to really going to look at it. Um, you, you want to assess that, and, and now, you know, their legal intelligence tool can make it very easy easy to find what judges' track records are on summary judgment, um, and you can kind of predict how things are likely to shake out. Uh, you need to deal with the experts head on uh, at summary judgment. Um, consider whether to make a Daubert motion or just consider whether to say that the experts sort of unreliable or, or unpersuasive, and, and you know, depending on what, what the facts and circumstances are. Um, Focus on the overall process. The plaintiffs love to nitpick uh, weaknesses. They love to point to things like, you know, alleged inconsistencies in the IPS, the absence of supposed policies of one kind or another, uh, but focus on the, the big picture because I think the big picture carries the day with the judge. Um, and, and keep in mind that cheapest is not best, um, highest performing is not the only prudent thing um, there are plenty of reasons why fiduciaries can pick one versus another in terms of investment options or fee arrangements, and I think courts are are, are open to hearing that argument. Uh, but what if it doesn't work and you get to trial? Well, let's take a look on the next slide. Um, hey, Ian, before we go to that next slide, yeah. let me just ask you a question on your first sure. bullet. So, even if a judge, you know, you think it's unlikely a judge would grant the motion. Are there still reasons why it might make sense to get kind of to, to still file summary judgment? And I guess what I'm thinking is what it, what is the benefit of trying to educate the judge on our theory in advance of a trial, even if we think a trial is inevitable? Yeah, I, that's a good point, Sam. That is certainly a, a benefit to consider in, in making a summary judgment motion. Um, if you think that the judge or the clerks are really going to read it, um, it can be persuasive, uh, you know, in sort of shaping the narrative for the court. Um, the, the discussion of what the experts will be allowed to testify to and how they fit into the case, which is going to be part of a summary judgment motion in most of these cases, is something that you sort of want to tee up at some point with the judge anyway. And a summary judgment motion is a good vehicle for doing that as well. So there's a lot of considerations. And like I said, I think it's unlikely you're going to see people stop filing these, um, but you know it's it's certainly something to think about whether you just want to force the plaintiff to go to trial because what we've seen is that of late the defense wins when the case goes to trial. Um, so on the next slide, uh, we've got some discussions of some trial wins. Um, 
Prime Healthcare uh, out of the Central District of California, which is where uh, several of the recent trials have been. Uh, I think just a fluke, but uh, there have been a lot of them there. Um, there were claims, the typical claims about investment selection, monitoring fees. Um, the court did what judges do often in bench trials and allowed the experts all to testify, but then basically found the plaintiff's experts totally unpersuasive. Um, because they didn't adequately describe industry practice and they, they sort of ignored the contrary evidence in the record uh, and had inconsistencies in their own opinions. Um, the uh, record keeping expert in this case um, had, uh, had come from uh, T. Rowe Price uh, where he allegedly, well, had, well, he had worked um, kind of in pricing record keeping, but he admitted that basically all he did was plug plan data into a computer program that spat out a price. And so the court said, well, you know, you, you, you can't really talk to anything that, you know, relates to this case in terms of the variables of how plan ought to be priced because all you ever did was input data to a machine that was dummy proof um, in his own admission. So, you know, the court discounted that entirely uh, and was persuaded by the defense experts who, you know, had real experience in the market um, advising plans and had actual research backing up what they were saying. Um, the court also rejected a whole laundry list of nitpicks of the fiduciary process and basically said, look, you know, overall, they were doing a good job, they were taking it seriously, and, um, you know, were trying to find a reasonable outcome for the plan, which didn't mean the cheapest. Um, on the next slide, um, we kind of cover some trial takeaways, and I'm mindful of the time here. But um, you know, from from Prime Healthcare, and, I, and there have been a few other trials uh, in other jurisdictions that have been similar, where what happens is the, you know, the defense witnesses get on the stand and ultimately are persuasive to the court in terms of showing them that, or showing the judge that they have been diligent and prudent and thoughtful, and they've sought advice from experts. Um, the, the defense tends to come out ahead. Um, we actually had a case that went to trial, uh, one of the California cases last year, and it was very much the same thing. Um, the judge had been, I would say, skeptical up to the point of trial about some of the uh, defense positions in the case, but once he had an opportunity to hear the witnesses, um, both the fact witnesses and the experts, he did, a, did essentially a 180 uh, and was persuaded that that the uh, products at issue were good products, the process was good and thorough and prudent, um, and sort of summarily rejected the defense uh, evidence to the contrary, uh, or the plaintiff evidence, rather, to the contrary, including their experts. Um, and what we've seen is that that, you know, diligent, uh, test, the testimony of dil about diligence by the uh, defense witnesses is critical. Um, so you're going to have to make a judgment about whether to take a case to trial based on, you know, what your witnesses are likely to say, and then you have to be willing to invest in the preparation. Um, I was reminded of the old adage about what does it take to get to Carnegie Hall? Uh, practice, 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 right? Um, that's key for going to trial in these cases because everything will be under the microscope. Um, judges seem to be totally unpersuaded by attempts to, pick apart the process if the process is basically good. Um, we've seen allegations cropping up about, you know, for example, the absence of a uh, plan expense policy, uh, which is not something that's required under ERISA, may not even be a good idea. My suspicion is that a plaintiff lawyer discovered one uh, in a case and now thinks everybody has to have one. Um, and you know, courts have had no problem rejecting those ideas and saying, look, this is, you know, this is outside of the scope of what's required. Um, plaintiff's experts tend to be very light on methodology um, and uh, tend to overreach in our experience to justify their criticisms. Um, as Tom said, they're often sort of shaping their opinion to meet the theory of the case. Um, and you discover frequently that there's nothing there, uh, that it disintegrates. So they've often um, taken in inconsistent positions in the past that you can highlight through cross-examination. Uh, so often there's a lot to work with 
um, from a defense perspective for a trial or, or for summary judgment, and often a lot of ammunition to attack the other side uh, in these cases. And I think what we're seeing uh, increasingly is as the defense uh, is getting fatigued by all of this litigation, um, an increasing appetite for taking cases all the way rather than just throwing money that, at them to make them go away. So uh, with luck, we'll see the trend continue. And with that, I will hand it over to Ada to talk about some of the additional legal issues and nuances that we've started seeing crop up in this case. Thanks, Ian. Kate, next slide, please. Okay, so another trend we've been watching very closely, and you can imagine with all the additional burdens that you're seeing there and some of the trial losses, that the plaintiff's bar is looking for some shortcuts. And a recent Ninth Circuit opinion has offered that at some level in our view, in the defense view, and is having a ripple effect across this area. We do expect the Supreme Court to address it at some level soon, because it's granted cert in one of the cases that I will be talking about shortly. Um, but <clears throat> overall, what we're seeing is that these prohibited transaction claims, which have always been pled, um, are now more readily surviving motions to dismiss, um, being a very big target for discovery, which is a somewhat new development. Um, and with that, we'll turn to the next slide, please, Kate. Okay, so what I want to talk about here um, is focus in on what the dispute is. So we have a Ninth Circuit opinion that interpreted this language on the screen one way, and we have a Second Circuit opinion in the Cornell case that interpreted another. And I think I was trying to figure out a way to boil this down, and essentially it's when you have a transaction with a party in interest, which has a very broad definition under ERISA, essentially any person or entity providing services to the plan, do you start with the assumption that it's a prohibited transaction or do you start with the assumption that it may be exempted and that there needs to be more burdens of proof and evidence to show that it falls under a prohibited transaction? So it centers around this language here, this introductory language in section 1106, which defines prohibited transactions. And in true ERISA form, um, it cites back to another section, which by itself also contains a number of exemptions. So it lists in this, except as provided in section 1108 of this title, so section 1108 lists a number of transactions that are exempt from 1106. Um, and it, for example, a contract between the plan and a party in interest that covers necessary services for which reasonable compensation is paid. Um, so the plaintiff's counsel in Bogilski, and if you've been listening to these uh, webinars, you've heard the pronunciation of this case name evolve over time. Um, if you can go to next slide, please, Kate. So this is the Ninth Circuit opinion that I referenced, um, which is now up before the Supreme Court on a petition for review, uh, awaiting an answer from the Supreme Court. So in this case, which came out before the, the Cornell case, which is the next case I'll be talking about, there was a discussion about what constituted a prohibited transaction. And the Ninth Circuit in that case concluded that essentially any transaction between the plan and a party in interest constituted a prohibited transaction. So it started with the presumption that the transaction was prohibited then it shifted to deciding whether one of the exemptions in uh, 1108 applied or one of the exemptions in 1106 applied. Um, and that is, that is an interpretation that we believe has done this sort of shortcut for prohibited transactions. But back to the facts of Bogilski. So the AT&T plan at issue in Bogilski used the same record keeper since 2005. In 2012 and 2014, the plan amended its agreement with the record keeper to allow for it to enter into a contract with other third parties. The first was for a brokerage window, and the second was for some financial advice, uh, both features of which we're uh, pretty familiar with in the 401k plan context. 
the contract um, had no further oversight over the contractual relationship between the third party and the record keeper. And plaintiffs alleged that that was a breach of fiduciary duty, that the fiduciaries in those instances had an obligation to see that contract, oversee that contract, and understand the compensation and ensure it was reasonable. Defendants are arguing this is a third party contract negotiated at arm's length between two parties, and it certainly applied to more plans than just the one at issue. Um, and they argued that they did not have an obligation, that that was not a fiduciary breach to not be involved, I guess, in that in that contractual relationship. Um, so they were successful, that is, the defendants were successful at the district court level. The Ninth Circuit reversed completely. So the Ninth Circuit essentially said, we're going to take this broad view of what constitutes a prohibited transaction. Anytime there's a amending of a contract or entering into a contract, um, we're going to call that a transaction that could be subject to be defined as a prohibited transaction. This, this reading has been described by other courts as somewhat absurd. So for example, if you have never had a contract with a service provider before, then that party is not a party in interest and your initial contract with them is subject to no oversight or no concerns from a prohibited transaction perspective, but subsequent amendments would pull you right into that, uh, even an amendment a day later. So there are definitely courts that have uh, disagreed with that interpretation. Uh, next slide, please. This also raises a number of questions about the burdens of proof. Um, who, who has the obligation to establish from the outset that one of those exemptions for reasonable necessary or reasonably compensated necessary services are not starting off as a prohibited transaction with the burden to show on defendants to show otherwise. Um, there are some uh, rulings in the Ninth Circuit that are somewhat inconsistent with this in terms of talking about what a fiduciary's responsibility is with respect to an arm's length contract that they're not privy to. Um, so we do expect this uh, to have an impact in the Ninth Circuit, and we do believe it's having an impact across the country in terms of pleading these claims. Um, the What happened after this opinion is, um, if we can go to the next slide, Kate, So the other case I referenced was the Second Circuit Cunningham versus Cornell University case. Um, this case is similar to what was presented in the Ninth Circuit, except with the caveat that it was reviewing a dismissal on a motion to dismiss. So the Ninth Circuit opinion had more facts in the record, certainly, and some claims were reviewed on, um, most claims, sorry, in the Ninth Circuit case were summary judgment cases. The Second Circuit opinion had some, some motion to dismiss claims that were being appealed and some summary judgment claims. And the prohibited transaction claim fell into uh, the motion to dismiss bucket. There, the court looked at that language, that same language you looked at earlier, and said that in order for that claim to get past a motion to dismiss, to plead a plausible claim, it must show that those exemptions on the other section, section 1108, do not apply. And the way that the complaint pleaded that claim in this Cornell University case, it pleaded only what the Ninth Circuit said all you have to plead, which is that you have a transaction between the plan and a party in interest. So the Second Circuit said that's insufficient. You need to at least plead at this level that one of those other exemptions doesn't apply before we get to assuming something is a prohibited transaction. Um, what I will say in terms of what is the impact on fee litigation in general, we've been talking a lot about how plaintiffs have been successful in some circuits in shifting the burden of loss causation to defendants to prove that the conduct did not impact the plan the way plaintiffs allege it did. These cases have the potential to do some of the same things. We are seeing in cases 
uh, that have been litigating prohibited transaction claims, the plaintiffs are arguing that they need not even show a breach of fiduciary duty, that all they have to show to establish a prohibited transaction is that it occurred and that there even need not be any harm as a result of the prohibited transaction to show a breach, to show that the transaction was prohibited from the outset. So we expect over the next few years, this portion of prohibited transactions to be heavily litigated and sorted out in terms of how do these exemptions interact with the definition of prohibited transaction. Okay, um, next slide, please. Okay, and the moment of the CLE, I'll read the number for everyone. It's SS6741. S is in Seifarth, S is in Shaw, 6741. And I would take, take a moment to scan the QR code, code and uh, use our high-tech way of submitting CLE. Okay, with that, I'll turn it over to Sam. So, I just want to say an alternate way, which Ada said she would do and didn't, was that she was going to say S is in Sam, S is in Schwartz, Fenwick. So use whatever you know reminder you want, pneumatic, I guess, to remember SS, but I think mine is the preferred. Anyway, moving uh, ahead two slides. Okay, so new cases on the horizon. So we're going to step a little bit out of the 401k space in some of these, but with the common factor being the Schlichter firm and what they're going after and being a real trendsetter in, in this space. So let me first talk about welfare plan cases. Oop, Ida, can you quick repeat the, the code? Oh, someone wrote back already. All right, we're good. Um, so there was a lot of brouhaha about a year and a half ago when the Schlichter firm did a press release that it was going to start targeting welfare plans and regarding uh, excessive fees. And to date, they have not entered uh, this market, but we have seen some litigation directly targeting welfare plans. We've also seen um, more litigation to date of plans actually suing uh, their third party administrators for failure to provide data um, when requested as part of an audit to actually do uh, the monitoring functions of the, the fiduciaries. But in the, um, the welfare plan case so far, the best exemplar is Lewandowski versus Johnson and Johnson. It's pending in the, the District of New Jersey. And the primary claim there relates to drug costs in the plan and specifically the argument that since some of the special pharmaceutical drugs um, could be obtained relatively cheaply on the open market, that the fees being paid by the plan, um, some of which if the complaint allegations are to be believed were, you know, thousands of times more than they would cost on on the open on the open market. Now Johnson and Johnson right now is uh, being reviewed on the court on a motion to dismiss and practitioners on both sides are really watching to see if they'll be able to overcome uh, this motion. And there's a lot of arguments that you know in view of the defense bar really make this an easy case to kick out on a motion to dismiss. The first is, while there are fees attached to welfare plans, just as there are to 401k plans, other than that, um, in operation, a welfare plan really is a defined benefit plan where you pay your premiums and in response to that, you get a defined set of plan benefits. There's no allegation in these cases that those defined benefits weren't provided. Rather, the allegation is that the fees that had to be paid for these benefits were too high. But again, in the, you know, use ERISA nomenclature, that is more rightly viewed 
as a set lore decision because the spread of pay between uh, the, the plan, you know, what the employer contributes and what participants contribute, that's baked into the language of the plan. And so it's not a fiduciary decision. Um, plaintiffs try to get around that by saying that in their view, the amount that an employer is willing to spend on wages and benefits is a fixed amount. And so if the employer was spending less on, or if the plan was spending less on drugs and on welfare costs overall, then it would have more money to give to employee salaries. And so paying inflated benefit plan costs is having uh, an overall lowering effect on salaries. Um, again, this is highly speculative. And even if this was um, a viable theory, it's still not really clear what the fiduciary link would be because, again, these are terms that are baked into uh, the plan. That said, there's a ton of momentum in the industry to try to rein in prescription drug prices. Um, as I'm sure many of you saw, there was a real takedown piece of pharmaceutical benefit managers this past weekend in the New York Times. They're kind of um, the exemplar in, you know, popular culture right now of, you know, the free market gone, gone awry. And so I think that there's hope that judges, even if they don't allow Johnson & Johnson to prevail, will allow a roadmap for future uh, plaintiff's lawyers to state a claim here. Uh, but anyway, th this is one one to watch. And I know on the compliance end, a lot of welfare plans are closely watching this and thinking ahead of what they can do from a compliance standpoint to best defend themselves against these cases. So let's go to the next slide. Sam, just to jump in before you move on to the next topic, I would note there was a decision from the Third Circuit um, recently in a in a precursor to the Johnson and Johnson case, um, dealing with similar issues. There, the question was the disposition by the by the employer of rebates from the PBM, whether they had to go back into the plan or not, uh, and everyone hoped that that the Third Circuit would say no standing, you know, you're you're out of luck. Um, they sort of said that. They said no standing as you pleaded it, but left the door ajar for for people to be able to articulate a standing theory. So, you know, Sam is spot on in saying the plaintiffs are going to sort of dance around and try and say that we did suffer some harm, even though you can't really draw a straight line to, from what the what happened to the harm. Um, but uh, you know, it, it seems like these cases have at least some viability post uh, the Third Circuit decision. No, and that's a great point, Ian. And I mean, it's important to note the how narrow Johnson and Johnson is in terms of the scope and universe of what could potentially be at issue in a claim charging welfare plan fees. You know, there's a lot of different service providers. There's a lot of different types of fee arrangements, and so. There's a lot of wiggle room for plaintiffs to try to morph their claims into, which again is really what we saw in days of yore at the start of the Schlichter fee litigation in 2006. You know, what's a very kind of regimented type of claim that's being filed now is super different than what was being brought initially. Um, so, all right, let's skip to the next slide. Okay, so. A case that the Schlichter firm has been behind um, all of all of the cases filed so far, maybe not on first blush, but on soon after filed copycat cases are pension risk transfer cases. These are obviously defined benefit cases, and to date they've been very narrow in that they're only targeting pension funds that have engaged in a risk transfer, which is you put the assets of the pension plan into an insurance provider and the insurance company handles paying the remainder of the benefits out 
and the only provider who has been targeted so far are company or plans who've made dealings with uh, Athene. And the argument has been since Athene is partially owned by private equity, even though before these lawsuits, Athene had an impeccable credit rating, since it had uh, this private equity ownership component, it's, you know, an evil entity and a terrible investment, and it's going to bring gloom and doom to, you know, the plan participants. That said, once you move past kind of the salacious arguments in the, in the complaints, we again feel there's really nothing here. And the, the reason is that, you know, and this is something, oh, you know, we can flip to the next slide because I actually go into detail there on, you know, some of the arguments that we think this lacks. First, plaintiffs haven't stated an injury. Right, they're not saying so plaintiffs are participants in these plans where the risk has been transferred to uh, to a theme. They, they haven't said they're not being paid benefits. What they're saying is that there's a higher risk of default under a theme and that they've also by being transferred to a private to a non plan entity. They're no longer protected by the PBGC. What this ignores is they're still governed by and subject to the state counterparts of the PBGC. But again, there's there's no injury. There's no evidence that there even would be an injury. Uh, their theory also hinges on their reading of this DOL interpretive bulletin 95-1, which provides the guidance that's available on pension risk transfers. Now, under the DOL, pension risk transfers are fine, with the guideline being when you're selecting an insurance vendor who can serve in this role, they need to be the safest annuity available. Plaintiffs are reading that word safe, safest and saying, see, safest means one. There is one unicorn out there, that is the safest, that's who you need to choose. But if you actually read the regulation or the guidelines, it's pretty clear that's not what they're saying. What they're really saying is an entity demonstrates its safest when it meets a fixed number of criteria. So safest is, we think, most correctly viewed as a category in which a number of uh, products can fit. If it was true that only one entity could be the safest, given the limits on how many uh, PRTs any entity can take in a year, that might mean that an entity, that a plan that wants to do a PRT might have to wait in line for a number of years to do it. And at that point, their one unicorn may have changed its stripes and they would need to start the waiting in line again as a new entity picked up, uh, you know, that title. It's, it's nonsensical. Furthermore, we think that uh, given the Loper Bright ruling and what that means for DOL guidance, here you're not even dealing with a regulation. So if someone wanted to interpret the DOL guidance in that uh, strained way that plaintiffs are arguing, we think strong, strong grounds would exist to say, look, the court needs to just go back to the basics and look at what ERISA says, and this is plainly fine. Uh, lastly, a PRT is not a fiduciary decision. It's a decision by the settlor to transfer risk. And as such, it's not properly viewed as a fiduciary decision. Uh, now, the independent advisors who advise the, the plan on making these PRTs, they're also named in, in the lawsuits. However, they're only being challenged for their ultimate decision in terms of the vendor they recommended. And there's nothing actually about the selection decision of the independent advisor that's being challenged. So you could kind of say the only fiduciary act here is irrelevant to the issues being litigated. Let's go on to the next slide. All right, so another 401k fee going, zooming back to 401k. Another 401k issue 
uh, that were really just seen as an add-on is in the, the forfeiture space. The argument is that the way that plans are disposing of their forfeiture accounts constitutes a prohibited transaction. And it's interesting to view this in light of what Ada was saying in the evolution of the law on prohibited transactions in that this is, I think, viewed uh, as a pretty uh, straightforward attempt by plaintiff's counsel to avoid a motion to dismiss by adding a PT claim and then saying, well, this is too complicated to address at, at the motion to dismiss stage and thereby getting the, the claims to survive that and then getting um, their pound of flesh in discovery in hopes of leveraging a high value settlement. Uh, that said, what these cases are saying is the way that plants are disposing of the 401k or of their forfeiture accounts is problematic because what a lot of plants are doing is they're using the funds in that account to offset the employer match, which would otherwise be contributed. And plaintiffs are saying, since you could also use this money in some plans to pay administrative services for the plan, that's actually what you had to do. And in doing this, they're ignoring, um, you know, guidance that exists that says it is permissible to use forfeiture funds to uh, offset match. And also, uh, and let's go to the next slide, the, you know, I think view, if you're going back to Ada's, oh, let's go one more, sorry. If you go back to Ada's slide and think about what is a prohibited transaction, an inherent in a prohibited transaction is a transaction with a plan. That is, you're taking plan assets moving them out of the plan to pay someone here you know assets are never leaving the plan they are in the forfeiture account and then you're using them to offset an employer match so they're staying in the plan and remaining in the plan and you know in our view the northern district of california recently got this um exactly right when it said that because of this you know, it fails to state a prohibited transaction claim. That said, there was a case from the Southern District of California that, that reached the opposite. And it took a much more expansive view of the prohibited transaction issue in that it, it noted, you know, the same thing as the Northern District saying, yeah, you know, I'm not exactly sure if this states a prohibited transaction and then I kind of threw up its hands. And I think that that's really what you see a lot of courts doing when they're faced with a prohibited transaction case, especially at the motion to dismiss stage, is it's so complicated to read those rules and digest them that they'd rather take a pass instead of getting it wrong. And so on that grounds, they allow, um, you know, what, at least those of us on the jaded defense part think are pretty BS cases that should never see the light of day um, and allow them to extend past um, a motion to dismiss. So I know we only have about a minute left and I see that John had a question on improv. Oh, good. We answered your question, John. That is, that's fabulous. Well, Ian and Ada and Tom, any, any last words of wisdom? No, thanks, Sam. I mean, I think it's, um, it's going to be interesting to see these new new theories evolve. Um, I think standing is, is going to be a key fight in many of these cases, and, and obviously the burden shifting and PT issues will be critical. So we'll, we'll keep everyone posted as we move forward. Awesome. I think we're, with that, we're done for today. We thank you all for attending. and. Um, as, as noted, we will be back, I'm sure, within a few months with some more updates and, and uh, latest highlights.